This is not good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. Oh, finally, finally, finally. Yeah. So, you know, you were talking about how you're here to help build community. Mm -hmm. You know, did, did I tell you this one before? That, you know, people don't come here to join an institution. An institution, yeah. Did you say that? Yeah, I did say that. That you. was so inspiring. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, keep quoting me. I love that. Now I'm going to uh, find a solution to my uh, to the problem yet. Now it's likely going to be here. Okay. Somebody's. Oh, but wait, hold on. I'm trying to figure out my life now, and. I think you have to flip it. Because uh, right now it's the camera's going that way. Who is that? That's, that's Beaver. <laughs> Jesus is loud. <clears throat> okay, yeah, you got it. So, finally, you got the right guy. Oh, Jesus is loud. So, don't mess up. If you knock it over, So the diamond eye is from the Russian perspective. Um, the rose code is from the English perspective. But the diamond eye sort of does transatlantic because she ends up meeting with the Roosevelt's. So I don't want uh, Dan to be going out to open the door. So I already put it out. Anyone who travels. Nobody pauses at all. They're probably like, how do you ask those questions? I don't know. Stay alive. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's getting excited. Oh. 
Okay. I'm going to try it again today. If it works, good. If it doesn't work, then I don't know what to do again. Uh, all right. I want to welcome you all to uh, Bible study, the third session. Um, and um, I would say before I make a couple of announcements at the very beginning, Trying to see the two announcements that I made this morning. Okay, so why not let us just begin with the opening prayer? We have the prayer set up. Um, yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I do not know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually to myself. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you, and I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire to please you. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Hear my prayers for Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So the thing I started, I will, first let me welcome you back to today's Bible study. Uh, we are doing something good. That, that is why you keep coming back. So thank you for coming back. I pray I don't uh, screw up or just piss you off so that you don't have to come back. So but. Keep coming back, please, because Jesus is here. Now, a couple of things to start with today. Somebody just told me, and I think I'm going to repeat it. I, I think I said it last week. Uh, but one of us in the morning session uh, did tell us about this podcast uh, by uh, Anderson Cooper. Uh, I don't know the spelling of Anderson, uh, but I think I got that of Cooper. So if you can't get this, just get this. Uh, so he has this podcast. It's available on Google Podcast and I think Apple uh, Podcast. I think I did listen on Apple. Um, so it's a very good uh, take on grief. One, that, one thing that makes it very, uh, I would say, profound for me as a person is the way, and we're going to talk about that with, Aisha, with Elijah today, is how she was able to channel her grief into almost like a mission. I mean, her grief became a sp springboard for a mission. And it's so beautiful, inspiring, but at the same time, I, I just kept asking myself, uh, can I even do that? But it's a good one if you can listen to uh, Mama Shu, that's the <coughs> uh, name of, the, of that from Adinson Cooper. Now, the other thing that, um, I don't know, this is donations, for what? Uh, he just dropped it off. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Maybe because he saw the Loyola shirt, she thought like, uh, yeah, these people need donation, they know you um, But the second one that I would also want to talk about is that I know for next week, the reading I did assign in the bulletin and others is the Gospel of Mark, but please, this is the one we're going to use for next week. It's the same story, but it is the version of Matthew. So when you see the Max version, uh, the reason why I'm going for the Max, uh, for the Matthew's version is that it is more dramatic. And I love drama, in case you don't know by now. So, uh, but it's, it's richer, and in a way, it's, it's really beautiful. So please... Uh, Note that I'm going to repeat it at the end of the Bible study also. Then don't forget, we also still have the uh, prayer intentions. Um, 
build up your intentions. We're going to keep praying over them and then we'll burn them uh, on the final day of the um, program of the study. Now, the man we are about, to, we want to talk about today is one of the, okay, did I, yes, I do have it, okay? Father, the man, yes. Just a quick question on those intentions, where do they go? They will put them in prayers, we pray, we'll put them at, at, uh, on the altar for mass <laughs> for the, till so the end of the Bible. Give them to you here? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So the man we're about to talk we want to talk about today, Elijah, is a very interesting character. He's one of the most powerful men we have in the Bible. In fact, you still see that he's one of the rare figures that appeared both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You remember the story of the Transfiguration, where Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus on the mountain. Um, he he was is known for so many miracles. He made kings. He dethroned kings. Uh, some of his miracles are a little silly. Some are too violent. And there was one that I really don't like. Uh, I think it was a couple of boys who saw him and called him the man with the bald head. And then the next thing he did was to call, is it lions or fire to just kill those boys? Now, uh, um, forget that about that man. But he has so many other things going uh, for him uh, in terms of miracles and in terms of his preaching. He was, a polit he was not just a religious figure. He was also a, a, a political force. Um, and... One of the things that is also, apart from the fact that he was in the Transfiguration in the Bible, um, he he's always paralleled with the man called John the Baptist. So, in case you do not know, Elijah is one of the two men or two persons in the Bible who did not die. Enoch did not experience a natural death. Elijah did not die. In fact, when I was young, one of the songs that I was singing is, God carried Elijah up in a whirlwind of fire, you know? But how do we relate him to John the Baptist? Okay? The first instance, the disciples of Jesus said, oh, there is this tradition. They were asking him this question. This question. There is this tradition that the Elijah must come before the Messiah comes. And, they re and Jesus replied, Elijah has come. The Elijah has come, but they treated him the way they wanted to treat him. Now, and the Bible, uh, the, the scripture it says immediately that the disciples knew that he was referring to John the Baptist. What are the parallels between John the Baptist and Elijah? Two, two main ones. One, is that both Elijah and John the Baptist spoke truth to power. He was able to face the power in his days, Elijah. And their greatest undoing, the two of them, is the wife of the king. Remember Jezebel? Remember Herodias for John the Baptist. So that is a basic uh, linkage between both Elijah and John the Baptist, and we do believe that the two <coughs> individuals are probably the same. But that is not where we're really going today. What we're going today is to see this character who has all this power, whom we see with a lot of miracles. But we are not seeing those miracles today. We are seeing him at his weakest point, which reminds us that no matter how powerful you are as an individual, no matter how holy an individual can be, there are those moments in which we, we, every one of us has his or our own weaknesses. Every one of us, we have that moment in our lives that we just sit on the, on the, on the edge of our bed and weep. Every single one of us have encountered that moment in which we just look 
words can no longer capture what we are going through. Only tears can fully express it at that moment. That is the Elijah that we are encountering today. And just before this story in Isaiah 19, first uh, book of Kings 19, he had this amazing victory over the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Baal and Asherah are two ancient gods. Asherah is always the consort of Baal. They always go together. So anywhere you see Baal, you definitely see Asherah. Uh, close to the image of Asherah or the poles. It, it, it usually is poles uh, to, at least we know of Asherah. I, I, don't, I think this is more of a, uh, uh, a storm god. Um, but Asherah is always with a pole. So they had this encounter on Mount Carmel. Carmel. Do you say Carmel or Car Carmel? Carmel. Carmel. Okay, so, and then he asked them to call their gods and see. Uh, what is going to happen, and those men weren't able to do that much. They are 400 on this side, 400 on that on this side. Uh, and Elijah, somehow, somehow, he was able to call God even after pouring water on the whole thing, and the whole thing caught fire. So we learn that Elijah immediately killed the 800. We don't know whether he did it single-handedly. But we are both what I'm pointing out is this story happens immediately after his greatest peak in life. That's the, in, in his own, in the Elijah cycle, he never reached this peak again. Never. So just imagine that after one's victory, and, and this is, in soccer, this is what we say. Uh, you know I love soccer a lot. Yeah. You are most vulnerable as a team immediately after you score a goal. That is the most vulnerable time because you are in this uh, aura of you have scored a goal. Players don't remember their positions again. They go together and <laughs> gather together and rejoice and before you know what is happening, they are still not in their positions by the time the game restarts. So um, it's the same almost for Elijah that he scored a heavy goal and then he fell into trouble. He doesn't even know what to do with his life again. Why not let us dig into it and see what God has to say? Okay? All right, um, chapter 19, I start from verse 1. It doesn't really matter which uh, translations you have. Um, Ahab told Jezebel, Ahab, 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 told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with his sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, May the gods do it to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Wow. The first person we hear speak is not even God. It's Jezebel. That's the first voice we are going to hear. Um, that even after that feat, everything that he has achieved, he did not even hear from God immediately. It is Jezebel that came in and said, I am going to kill you just as you killed the prophets of Baal and Asher. And by the way, she's, I, think she's a, uh, it's Edda, it's, I think she's a Sidonian princess. She's from Sidon. Uh, and Tyre and Sidon, uh, they, in the ancient world, they had the best currency. We are going to encounter that in the story of next week, when that woman will be called a Syrophoenician woman. <coughs> but note again, so she's, she's a Sidonian princess, I believe. I believe she's a Sidonian princess. And when she goes, she packs all her gods and goddesses along with them. Uh, I think I've told you this before, you, you probably want to hear it again, that my grandfather had um, uh, 13 wives, and don't scream yet, we've not gotten to the stage of screaming. <laughs> and one thing that is very interesting in his household is that every single wife has a right to what they want to worship. He, he does not, 
uh, at a stage in his life, he got into the church the, when he had a second wife, and they told him, the pastor told him, Mr. James, I heard you got a new wife yesterday. Uh, do you know that it's against the teachings of the church? He wasn't a Catholic. Mm -hmm. He plays the uh, piano at, um, I think my mother would say she's better than, he's better than Catherine. But I don't know that. <laughs> but, but my grandfather was good at the piano, and he walked out. He said some words that I won't repeat because it's online now. <laughs> uh, and he walked out of the church, and he never came back to the church again. Interestingly, he was, uh, he was very instrumental in me becoming a priest, but that's story for another day. Uh, but one thing that, is very, that I know about him throughout was that each of his wife has their freedom of worship, so to speak. My grandmother became a Catholic because of me. Story for another day, okay? <laughs> uh, she was my first, uh, she's the first person that I brought into the church. And if she's the only person I brought into the church, that is enough for me, you know? Um, so, but this is, Ash, this is Jezebel with his uh, retinue of, of prophets. Now, what happens next? Then he became afraid. That is verse 3. Mm -hmm. Just imagine. Fear has crept into his life. This man that put fear into 800 people's lives. He's now afraid. You know? And that's why I said no matter how powerful we are sometimes. No matter how great we are. No matter how holy we are. There are moments in which we'll feel our own weaknesses. And it's, all, it's good because it reminds us that we are human. Sometimes when we achieve too much in life, we forget too soon that we are human. And that is why, that is how easily people become tyrants. People become despots. Because they easily forget they are human because maybe of one achievement or the other. But again, here we see him. He was afraid. He got up and fled for his life. He cannot even stand Jezebel. And he fled completely. You know? And that's one of the things that I'm still going to say when we talk about the basic lessons. Sometimes you just have to choose your battles. You just, it is not every fight that you stay to fight. Sometimes you just learn to say, okay, I just need to go. We have a saying in my culture that says, if you don't, if your hand is not on the base of the sword, never ask who killed your father. Does that make sense? If your hand is not at the base of the sword, don't ask the people who killed your father. Which means if you don't have, if your hand is not on the strongest part of the sword, that you can swing very well, you are in a vulnerable position. To attack anybody or to say okay to retaliate over the killing of one's dad or, or, or not so we can see this is Elijah saying you know what I can't stand this I can't stand this situation I have to I have to flee fly or running away is not always a sign of weakness sometimes it's a sign of wisdom people can go back and recoup have you this is this is not always like this is not always very good. The, the, the bandit in Nigeria, it's, the, it's, it's not, are they bulls, the one that, the rams. Have you seen the rams fight before? You know, they, they want to launch again. What do they do? They go back and then hit again. It's almost like that sometimes. It's not every instance that you reply every single person who is trying to attack us. It's not every, it is not every single battle we fight. Sometimes you just know that. No, I need to run and run. So he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba. Okay, so uh, there is Dan and Beersheba. Whenever you see these two cities uh, in, in the Bible, this is the most northern part of Israel, and this is the most southern part of Israel. So when the Bible says, from Dan to Beersheba, it's trying to say the whole land of Israel, okay? It's in the Psalms, we see them there. But what, is, what he's doing now, he's running to the most southern part of Israel, which means he's almost like leaving the country. 
It's like, because if the queen wants to attack you, especially <clears throat> in the ancient world that they have spies everywhere, you will run as far away as you can. So he goes to the most southern part of the country. And what happens? He came to Bathsheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. Note that. It is a very important line. He left his servant there. Some battles in life, no one can fight it with, for you. You have to fight it alone. There are some journeys in life no other person can understand us. We just have to make that journey alone. So no matter how much of a usefulness the servant has, it's just like, you know what? You stay here. This is between me and God. This is my life. So there are some battles in life. There are some situations in life. We don't need to depend on any other person. It is us and God. Um, then we go to verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Again, he goes into the wilderness. Um, and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. Now, if there is any figure, if there is any story in the Bible that is very paradigmatic of depression, it is this story. <clears throat> because sometimes when people have chronic depression, what do they say? They want to die. Jonah did. Yeah. He, he said, did I'm say that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. plant. Just kill me now, you know? Yeah. Uh, and we see it again and again among us, like people who just say, you know what? I'm done. Um, and he says it here. Did that, this is not the only time he's going to say it. He's going to say it again. Um, then he continues It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. So he carries the burden of the past. He carries the burdens of his ancestors. And with that, it is too heavy. And sometimes we do that too. We carry the burdens of the past. And it becomes very heavy for us. And that's the problem with depression sometimes. Whether it looks back or it looks forward, it's always bleak. It doesn't see any hope. Not in the past, not in the future. And that is what we have with Elijah here, saying, you know what? He's not looking at the past. He has even forgotten about the future. And don't forget that he's not even remembering the whole deal of the past. Less than a day or two days before, he did a mighty thing, right? But he's now saying, you know what? Let me die. He's bearing, and what's the reason again? He says, for I'm no better than my ancestors. What even makes him think he can be better than his ancestors? Isn't that funny? In a way. Yeah, we pray that our children uh, go better than, than what, whatever we have done. But we should never be arrested or we should never be detained or we should never uh, be incarcerated by our past. You know, the past is where it should always be the past. We should always learn to forgive our past sometimes. Uh, but again, that's Elijah. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. Two things here. One, because I'm still coming back to this. Um, it's the question of Jezebel did not go to Elijah directly. What did he do? He sent a messenger to do. So we have Jezebel and her messenger. I think this is the spelling of messenger in my own language. <laughs> um, then what happens? God sends his own angel. So for every messenger that Jezebel has, God has a counter messenger. And even in the wilderness, God is not leaving Elijah alone. And remember the thing that he does. <clears throat> what he does immediately when he gets there was to sleep. 
Again, this is a very major characteristic of those going through the depression. They just always want to sleep. Sometimes they say, uh, okay, let me just sleep and even die through the sleep, you know. Um, so we can see again, he is exhibiting at almost every level uh, an individual who is not just facing persecution. Internally, he's broken. Internally, he can't hold it together again. Um, then the angel came and said, uh, get up. The angel touched him and said, get up and eat. You know, God knows that we should not joke with food. You know, I like food a lot. I cannot <laughs> joke with food. Um, even though I don't eat well, I should as I should. And um, the other thing with, with, um, with Elijah here is the impact of fear in his life. I think we've spoken about that before. There's this book by uh, C.S. Lewis. It's called Grief, Grief Observed. He wrote it after he lost his wife. And one of the definitions that he gives grief in that <coughs> book, which I find very interesting, was that he, he said no one ever told him that grief is like fear. And we see that again and again, even in our own lives, that losses sometimes we feel this fear of how is the future going to be, or the fear of if God can do this now, or if God can allow this to happen, what else can he allow to happen? It's, it's, it's a real fear when we experience some grief. So with C.S. Lewis, there is a huge relationship between grief and fear, because something has been taken away from us. And again, this is what Elijah is really facing here. Then he said, get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. Again, he sleeps. Uh, it's still like he's not getting over it. Um, um, then the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. See, again... Uh, it's another, like I said, like you sometimes you even have to beg those going through chronic de depression to eat. Eat, eat again. Eat, they will beg them to eat. This is what the angel is just trying to do with Elijah here. Like, hey, please eat. The journey is. Then he got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the <coughs> Mount of, of, of God. So when you see Horeb in the Bible, Horeb is the same mountain as Sinai. Um, so this is this is these are two um, these are two literary traditions. Some traditions use the word Horeb, some traditions use the word Sinai, but it is the same mountain that is being talked about. And if you remember in the Bible, where did the children of Israel get the Ten Commandments? It was Sinai. So he's going back again. He's heading to where uh, the source of their religious faith in Israel. He's going back there. He doesn't know what he's going to encounter there. And don't forget too that when God gave that, those Ten Commandments, don't forget that it was accompanied with earthquakes and thunder and fire and so many things like that. Okay, he's heading there. This is a man that is so afraid he doesn't know what the future is, but he has a vision of where he is going. Okay? Now, then at that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? That is the first time God is going to talk to him. And God is not even saying, Hey, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry for what you're going through. Like, uh, how did you get to this? No, it's like, Dude, you're in the wrong place. Well, what are you doing here? <laughs> there, there is no evil like, hey, 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 God has forgotten about like, like petting him. No. It's like, dude, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, and again, Elijah became a Nigerian. <laughs> Nigerians are dramatic. See what, how he says it. Uh, he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. 
He never, he, he never said he just killed 800 people. He said they, are, they, are, they, are one, they have killed a lot of people. Uh, la, 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 la. Okay. And God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Now, there was a great wind, so strong, that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. What do you have in the translation? How does it put it? Gentle, tiny whispering. Um, yeah, the, the, the Greek word, uh, the, Hebrew, it's written in the Hebrew word is uh, a, a soundless, something like a sound of silence. How does silence even have a sound? Ask Simon and Girl. <laughs> uh, and, and you remember what we said a couple of uh, weeks ago that silence itself can be God's own form of communication for God even silence can be a language and we have to be able to know that we have to be able to discern where exactly that the language is coming at. and this is Elijah after, and don't forget it's not that God cannot be in the in, in the earthquake, in the mountain. And he's been in there before. We've seen him by fire. Even in, in the New Testament, we see that he comes as a tongue of fire on, on the day of the Holy Spirit. But for every single individual, God has a different dimension to approach us. Okay? Now, we used to have a coach in, in uh, Manchester United. He's the most successful coach in the history of football. Okay? He was there for 26 years. Okay? Started in 86, ended 2012, I think. He was a tough guy. He trained David Beckham before he came over to the United States to make a lot of money. Now, he has a strategy, and which I loved much. When Cristiano Ronaldo is one of the, before we started hearing about Messi, Ronaldo burst into the scene. Ronaldo came into Manchester United at the age of 16. If you touch him, Pam, he's falling on the ground. He's not getting up again. He fakes injury like crazy. <laughs> so you know what Sir Alex Ferguson did? He caught two of the older players, paid them to kick him. And with his career, he's one of the players that have the least, least injuries. He would never fake injuries on the, the top of him off. Another player came after Manchester, after Cristiano Ronaldo. He saw the same country from Cristiano Ronaldo. Man, they are both from Portugal. And when they started kicking him, Sir Alex called them back and said, don't do it. And I said, but you did that for Cristiano. He said, these two individuals are different. If you kick this guy, you're going to kill him. If you kick that one, he's going to get stronger. And that's the way, in a way, God deals with every single one of us. The way he's going to deal with me is different. Some of us, like, like I said last week, uh, last week, God knows that for Paul, for instance, there is no way Paul is going to become a Christian if he wasn't knocked down the horse. You know? And he also knows that for some persons, all he needed to do is just walk by their side and say, dude, follow me. And they follow me. <laughs> but for Paul, no, 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 no. That dude, no. He has to be knocked down the horse, take some eyesight away from him before he's able to say, yeah, can I see you, Lord? You know? And that's the same with Elijah here. He has gone through a lot in his life that he has gone through a lot of chaos that the only way God can reach out to him now is that sound of silence. 
Okay, now. Uh, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? You see, he repeats the same thing again. Like God is saying, What's your business here? What are you really doing here? Give me a reason. Why you are here. It's almost like my grade school teacher finding me in the wrong place and say, give me ten reasons why you are not in the classroom now. <laughs> you know, and this is God saying, what are you doing here? Then again, he became a Nigerian. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites I have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I am alone, I'm left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He never, he never changes what he wants to say. He doesn't even tell God what he wants. And again, um, you, you see this same man, who like ten verses before, says he wants to die, He's now complaining to God that they want to take his life away. <laughs> and one thing that that teaches me is that I thank God that God does not answer every single prayer we pray. You know? If it is every single prayer we pray that God answers, we are crazy by now. This is saying, I want to die 10 minutes ago, and uh, 10 minutes later I say, oh, they want to kill me. Which one is which? What is really going on here, Elijah? Okay? And God's uh, reply, after telling him over and over again that he's in the wrong place, this is God's reply. Then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. God is telling him, go back to where you're coming from. Oh, boy. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Meloha, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yes, yet. I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Wow. 7,000 that he doesn't know nothing <clears throat> about. But, but first thing, God does not even like say, like express sorrow for what has happened. What did he do? He gave him a new task. And sometimes that is what heals, that is what helps us to overcome some grief or crisis. If we have a new mission, we have a new purpose. If we have a new mission, we have a new vision. It's almost like God saying, the, the only thing that can give you joy in your life now is get a job, get to work immediately. This, is, this, this and this and this is what you're going to do. And also to remind him that you are not as lonely <coughs> as you think. You know, you, even though you don't see, there, there's a cloud of witnesses surrounding you. As a matter of fact, I am going to give you a successor. You know, uh, I don't know if you've ever read this book. Um, it's The Power and the Glory by Graham Greene. It's a very good book. It's Catholic too. Okay. It, he writes it about the Catholic Church in Mexico. And it's the story of when the church was being persecuted. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for you. Because if anybody spoils a TV show for me, I don't talk to them for six months. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know what it means to spoil a show or anything. But I, so, there was only one single priest in, Me in the whole of Mexico. Because every other one has been killed. So, he's the only one going around giving all the sacraments. Another person has died of this. He shows up. Another, but the problem with this priest is that he's the worst model of a priest. He drinks like crazy. 
Sometimes he's drunk by the time they wake up. Father, can you come and give last right to this person? He puts his bottle in his blood again and just goes. And eventually he was killed. But I think Graham Greene, and he's, he does this a lot, Graham Greene, he's, 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 he's an Englishman who spent a lot of time in, in, in Mexico, actually. And he just tries to see that in the darkness of human life sometimes, even in our greatest witnesses, the glory of God can actually shine in us. And towards the end, after the, like, this is where, the, this is where I'm not going to spoil it, you just like see almost like what we have in Elijah today, you know? Like God's still saying, there are still 7,000 people in this land that has not even encountered Baal at all. So we are, none of us is ever, ever alone in our own lives. We are never as alone as we think. Let's go to the um, basic lessons that I want to talk about, the one we have on, on, on our sheet. Um, even though I did like uh, walk back a little bit on number one uh, in the morning, I still think there is a sort of value there that sometimes doing what is right is our greatest source of trouble. The world cannot just stand what is right. You know, the world does not have the capacity to endure righteousness or right for the most part. We prefer to kill a prophet and 50 years after worship that prophet. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and that's the case with Elijah. He, he, according to him, let's look, it, let, look at it from his own perspective. He was doing what is right for God. And again, that is the greatest source of his own trouble. I already said this earlier on, uh, but I'm going to repeat it again. That the best solution sometimes in a situation is to run. Do not wait to fight. And I have there the serenity prayer. Um, and a quotation also from Alexander Pope. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. We have to be very careful about the battles that we choose in life. We need to choose our battle. If not, we will never last. Number three, avoid bearing the burden of history. It is always heavier than we carry. There is no family in this world that does not have a part of history that we don't want to remember. You know? But that does not mean that that history should define us. Every one of us can always, always, always be better than our history. And that's what God was trying to tell Elijah. Like, forget about all these ancestors you are talking about that you are not better than, you know. And as you can see even later on in history, he was the only one of three. This man who says he's not better than his ancestors, he's like, he got, he was on the dean's role when they had Jesus' transfiguration. It was him, Moses, that were with Jesus on the mountain. So that means he was able to transcend his ancestors in a lot of ways. Um, watch for the angels and be an angel to others for others. Just like we had the angel in, a, um, in, the, in the passage that came twice to tell Elijah, wake up and eat something. Food and rest. Accept and recognize every help we can get. Sometimes in, in life, we, uh, and grief does this a lot. Grief or troubles wants to make us to go into our shell, you know. Especially when we get, when we encounter griefs of betrayal. When people betray us sometimes, we find it difficult to trust anybody again. Um, but this is very important that we, we need to accept, record, I think recognize should come first. Recognize and accept every help we can get. Uh, to demand for help or to ask for help, I have always believed, is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. It's that realization that we have come to the end of our own strength. And we can now uh, climb on, this, on the strength of others. And this is also very important, number six. We have the tendency 
to exaggerate our experiences since we are alone. And we so, feel, so we feel we are lonely in the world. We are never as lonely as we think. Despondency has a way of selectively focusing on certain facts from life and conveniently overlooking others. As he gushed out of his lonely complaint, as he gushed out his lonely complaint about being the only faithful one left, Elijah forgot about the great multitudes at Carmel who acknowledged that was God. He forgot about the 100 prophets protected by courageous Obadiah. Despair is always colorblind. It can only see the dark hints. You know? Um, and I think it's somebody else who also says that when, um, <clears throat> when we cry, I don't know if it's my mom who said this. She said a lot of things that I think I can claim that I'm the one who invented it. Um, <laughs> but that when we cry sometimes, the tears block our capacity to see again, you know? So we can see into the future again, and that, that's what despair does. It makes us, and, and the devil also does that. It makes us feel like, yeah, this is a long, we are the only person in the world. And it happens also again to those going through chronic depression. They feel that they are the only one. They feel that nothing can, um, can um, alleviate the pain they are going through. Okay, uh, number seven. Things are never quite as hopeless as they appear to us in our moments of crisis. We have a saying in Nigeria. I told you how dramatic we are. Mm -hmm. We are beautifully dramatic. And this is what we say in my country. Do not tell your God how big your problems are, but tell your problems how big your God is. <laughs> yeah, that's Nigeria, you know? I can, I can put my name to it. <laughs> um, we grew up knowing that, and, and they also have a song in, in that, also in, in the country. Um, thank myself. I will remember one, and if, if I can remember it very well, I'll still sing it and translate it. Now, number eight, we need some serious time for silence. This is what Blaise Pascal said. I think he exaggerates it, but there is some truth in it. All of humanity's problems stems from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Isn't that funny? <laughs> it's like, get some quiet time, man. Maybe that can help. Um, and that still comes to the fact that sometimes we just need to be alone to be able to communicate with our Creator. And that's what Elijah did when he told his uh, um, servant, just stay here, um, don't follow me. Um, and sometimes all I just do, I think I do it twice a day. I didn't do it again at, at today. Probably should still do it this evening. It's that I go to the lake, you know. I just see the water going up and down. Then I throw, I throw all my troubles into the lake. And last week when I told Sister Matilda, uh, who is not here today, and I need to know why she's not here. She's the only one who is going to be punished for not coming to class. <laughs> oh, because she's a Nigerian. So I, I told her, she just sleeps on Granville, that I'm at the lake, I'm just looking, and I'm throwing my troubles into the lake. And she said something beautiful. She said, please, Father, also take some peace from the lake when you are going back home, you know. So just, we need that moment of silence. We need that moment of just being alone with our God. Uh, I think among the uh, evangelicals and Protestants, it's always called quiet time. You know? <laughs> so, it's on quiet time with Jesus. Number nine, stop trying to calm the storm. Calm yourself. The storm will pass. That's also another beautiful one. Then we have one about peace. We have one about peace from uh, St. Uh, Francis de Sales. Uh, when we lose inner peace, we are in the wrong place for spiritual life. The devil does his utmost to banish peace from one's heart because he knows that God abides in peace and it, it is in peace that he accomplishes his great things. Some persons don't want to see another person in peace. <clears throat> Once they see that they are in peace, they try their best to get away that peace. It's almost like this young boy in the UK. It's in Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. They told this boy, who is God? What, how can you describe God? Uh, and that boy said, God is this individual who is snooping around, looking for whoever is having fun, 
and trying to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the image of God that he has grown up with. Um, but the God that we serve is a God that should give inner peace. If we are not having peace about something, maybe that thing is not from God. Because God communicates peace. There is nothing that God gives that does not communicate peace. If we are trying to attain something and it is not giving us peace, it is most likely not from God. I'll talk about that later. Now, number 11. It is easy to forget in the moment what God has done in the past. Elijah did not even remember his victories on Mount Carmel when God asked him what he was doing here. We've also spoken about this. Mission sometimes heals our misery. We can turn our misery into mission. And I think this is where the podcast about Mama Shu also really comes into play because she's an individual who was able to transform her own uh, uh, grief into mission uh, and does things for uh, those he has lo- she had lost. Number 13, keep, good, keep at the good work even if you cannot see the results. And finally, this is a beautiful quotation from Rumi, the passion poet. I love Rumi. Rumi says, sorrow prepares you for joy. It violently <coughs> strips everything out of your house so that new joy can find space to enter. It shakes the yellow leaves from the bow of your heart so that fresh green leaves can grow in their place. It pulls out the rooting roots so that new roots hidden underneath have room to grow. Whatever sorrow shakes from your heart, far better things will take their place. Beautiful from Rome. All right, so why not let us just go to the discussion questions, and I'm going to assign the group as follows. Oh, boy. Uh, numbers one and two. Numbers three and four. Numbers five. Number six. Oh, five and six together. <laughs> I changed my mind. Mm. All right. What is the best Catholic approach to spiritual <coughs> depression? Uh, eight minutes. All right. Mm-hmm. I also think reconciliation. Um, you know, to, 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 to go to the priest and, and you know, this is what is troubling me. Um, reconciliation, confession. I mean, not in the fire and brimstone, you're bad kind of, but in the in the real discussion. <laughs> Because I think that that can help with, you know, the alone yeah. feeling. Mm-hmm. That, so, because p- part of when I've had spiritual depression is, is the isolation, the feeling that there's something wrong with me. And I, no one can access me, and no one can. But everybody plays hard games. Yeah, I mean, I know that. For me, sacrament of penance is not marked as a cure for depression. Yeah, I do need. 
But it is. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 A it's good Catholic insight. Because yeah. <clears throat> a lot of times depression is about what I've done is so yeah. horrible and shameful and disgusting, you know, that yeah. I can't possibly. And the functional process of, of, of confession is. No, you're not that bad. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's built into 12 steps, too. Yeah, I was going to say that really it's the sense of community, I think, that helps people um, move away from that feeling of aloneness. You know, when they feel part of. Uh, I heard something a while back about you know people who had been estranged from the church, um, and often that leads to a lot of sadness and pain. And all that is to uh, just invite them back. Let God do the rest. Just invite them back, and I think that. I thought um, I that idea I of being part, uh -huh. invited back to a community, closer, 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 it can be big. So yesterday, I get a text that you have to Also, the, the rhythm of both the liturgical year and the Mass itself. <laughs> we do this now, and then we do this, and then we do that. Like, just that movement is part of the thing with depression is that they can't move. So just the... I didn't even ask for that. Okay, I've done Mass, check. Like, I can say that I've done that, and that makes me feel better about myself. And it's a structure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ignatian spirituality, which I've had a significant background in St. Ignatius and yes. his approach and what he calls discernment of spirits, which includes what Paul talked about. Uh, I don't know how they you know, if you're feeling down, down yeah, that's not that. coming from God. Right. Uh, you recognize God by what consoles you and gives you purpose. Right. Right. Oh, no, so. hmm. The more. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. The more. The mo well, yeah, it leads you Some into the more, yeah, which is like keep going. Yeah. yeah, you can do more. So you still have a purpose. But by trying to discern <coughs> the action of the good spirit from the bad spirit, in terms of the nature of the good spirit, the good spirit brings you consolation and brings you forward, and the bad spirit wants you to feel depressed. What's the difference between spiritual depression or depression? Yeah. Um, well, it depends on how clinical you want to get. Right? <laughs> I mean, if you want to get clinical, right? Well, so I do think about it in those terms, but not only. No, no, but I mean, I am too. Um, so, you know, it's it it. I don't think there's a whole lot of difference in <clears throat> in reality. Like people who have depression are completely depleted of everything. But not everybody. Right, there isn't really a depression. spiritual depression by their symptoms. <laughs> but.
more color and there is more words than you need to. You know, any depression is a spiritual depression. Right, that's what it, that, yeah. But not everybody can access that. Like you have to frame it in a way that people can access it. Yeah, and he said, right. you can use the rector. Well, pretty much, but also just number Right? So, so if you're in a spiritual context, then people can see the depression as spiritual. You know, Elijah could see that it was a spiritual depression. But if you don't have that. All right, the return of the last Jedi. Um, <laughs> I am back. Why uh, don't right understand we group? What? Well, how can we create oasis of silence to hear more from God? What do you have? <coughs> yeah. Right. Right. And then there's our uh -huh. judgment whether it's spiritual and their judgment. Uh -huh. Too. And then I was yeah, more it's, like it's a whole nother. Yeah, I find it easier like <laughs> right. we, we don't busy do. doing stuff like no. doing a task, like doing the dishes or walking to and from the L or something like that. Uh, that then you like can you know hear and spend time in the silence that wow. way. I mean, I, I do think uh, what we said about how different personalities approach yeah. towards different yeah. things yeah. yeah. is also very key here. Some. Like I can't, uh, when I was studying for my uh, PhD, uh, so I used to, I live in Skokie in St. Peter's, I cannot study where everywhere is silent. So I'll go to Panera, buy a $2 coffee, and own a space for the rest of the day. <laughs> because they have this little music that keeps playing all yeah. through the day. So I am there just walking. And at a point in time, everybody knew me in Skokie and they knew my spot there. Like, <laughs> um, so when it comes to prayers too, uh, people, some people like Hail Mary. Some people, I've seen somebody who said she doesn't have a very good relationship with her mother. Hail Mary is very difficult. Um, and she said there was a time she was trying to, you know, during the pandemic, they said we should wash our hands and be praying Hail Mary. Uh, she did come to meet me and said, is there any other prayer that she can pray apart from Hail Mary? Because she's finding it difficult to connect with Mary because of the challenge she has with her mother. And some persons find their father difficult also because of their relationship with their food and dads. So, spirituality, prayer, creating space for God, all comes down to our personalities, you know. Um, so just look for what is good for you, what fits your personality, and stick to it, you know. Uh, sometimes it takes work, sometimes it takes us to discover, like me, I like waking up very early, not to talk to people. <laughs> I cannot be a normal human being before 10 a.m. Oh, wow. Now, I can wake up and pray and read, but if I come out before 10 a.m., there's a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I prefer to walk like somewhere else, be in my room, or but I get my brain gets like activated more once it is 10 a.m. And for the most part, it shuts down. When it is 5 p.m. So if I'm saying some crazy, <laughs> if I'm saying some crazy stuff, it's because it's shut down. Now number two, how can we differentiate when we hear from God or when we are hearing from ourselves? This is a very interesting one because uh, Augustine talks very well about it because sometimes we think we are hearing from God, but we're just hearing from ourselves. There are times in which I just wish to. I wish to buy an iPhone over and over again before I know what is happening. God was telling me to buy an iPhone, you know? So it can be very difficult. What is your own, uh, what is your own answer to that? Well, I gave a funny story, but um, I had made an appointment to see an eye doctor thinking she was at the hospital that's close to me. And it turns out she was like almost 45, 30 to 45 minutes away. And so for a month, I've been stewing because the, uh, the appointment was supposed to be next week, March 12th. And <laughs> Which, I, by the way, is my birthday in case. Oh! Um, <laughs> well, maybe, uh, I 
Maybe God is listening to you instead of me. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> but anyway, he, he did listen to me because I got a text yesterday saying, you have to cancel the appointment for that doctor and reschedule. And I said, God, you knew my mind. You knew oh. my mind. So I, I found out for sure that that was God's will because I didn't tell myself that. Yeah, I've, uh, yeah I, I have heard similar stories to that, that it just comes almost what you are thinking. Uh, what you are praying for, even though you have not verbalized it, just just happens, and it can be a very good way to uh, to also hear from God. Uh, try to look for a book. This book is a very good one. About uh, it's searching for and maintaining peace. You can pass it around the um, tables. Um, where is uh, this? It's by one father, Philip Jacquees, and he he has a lot. He has some tricks. I won't call it tricks, but for some suggestions about hearing from about when we know that something is from God. Uh, the title of the book is "Searching for and Maintaining Peace." It's uh, I don't like I don't like prison books a lot. Uh, because I always have problems with every single book. But I don't have a single problem with that book. It is very good. Very good. Uh, it's smart but powerful. Now, he gives some suggestions. And this, it's, this is a real problem for me. Maybe that's why I am. And I gave that this story this morning uh, when I was just like, I was seriously thinking about changing my phone. And then I called my younger sister the youngest, who uh, I thought like she sounds like the sounding board I can hear from God through her. And I've been praying about getting a phone sincerely for some time. And then, uh, but I wasn't convinced. I was convinced that God was talking to me to get a phone. <laughs> but, but I wanted to hear from her. So she said, and I called her you today, I feel like getting this phone. And she said, okay. Uh, and I said, I feel God is telling me to get it. <laughs> and she's like, no, I don't think God is asking me to get it. <laughs> but for Father Philip Jacques, two things. Peace of mind. If that thing gives you a peace of mind, it's most likely to be from God. Okay? Um, if, it's, if, it, if it disorganizes the mind... Um, yeah, most, I would say, I would say 100, like 99% of the time, whatever God gives us, gives us peace. But the other one is, he says that uh, when we have two choices to make, this is more difficult to narrow down. He says once we have two choices to make between A and B, he suggests that we pray a lot about the two. We are very confused. We pray. The second thing he says is consult people. Consult, maybe you have a spiritual director or you have a prayer partner. Consult them. Talk to them about it. And at the end, follow your mind. He says even if we end up making a mistake because we have prayed about it, because we have followed our steps, God will find a way to right the, the errors. So, uh, it's always, and, and I have used it a couple of times. That doesn't mean that I don't mess up, but that's part of life, I guess. Um, but thank you. Number three, what's the best Catholic approach to spiritual depression or depression of any form? Well, um, one of the things we talked about was uh, Ignatian discernment, which is very similar to this. Okay. Ignatius says he's... Is something coming from the bad spirit or the good spirit? The good spirit gives you consolation, moves you forward, mm -hmm. gives you peace. Mm -hmm. the, the bad spirit, if you feel troubled and concerned about something, that is coming from the bad spirit. And so that can move you through your depression. Mm -hmm. that. And then we also talked about sacrament of reconciliation, mm -hmm. which is not designed as an anti-depression. Mm -hmm 
medicine, mm -hmm. but in fact can be because it takes the burden away. Mm -hmm. To the extent that your depression is because of something you did mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. being persecuted by someone else at mm -hmm. least, sure. you go and it has that effect um, even though it's not. Design for that. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I get that. And, and um, also, and also, you, you're not in it by yourself anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the 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 thing about you know he was there, he was starving, he wasn't drinking, he was under the tree, you know this is it. I've, I'm I'm a failure. I'm I'm a waste. And then you go and you know through the process here. The message that no, that's okay. You're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there is a way out of this hell. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's that underlines the the value of a community, right? Mm -hmm. Because before you can go to the judge and say <clears throat> uh, you want to go and meet a priest for confession, you have to be assured that that priest is not going to spiritually abuse you at the confessional. Yeah. I've heard instances of priests, past priests, screaming at people. Mm -hmm at the confessional. Mm -hmm. If any priest ever shouts at you or uh, just screams at you or does anything like that at the confessional, you have a right as a Catholic to walk out. He's not the only priest in the world. Look for another priest mm -hmm. and do your confession. So, uh, and confession is not also just about the saints, you know, it's also about bearing your mind out to, to the priest. Sometimes it's good to be able to not just maybe just the confession but spiritual direction you know um i had a situation in which and it, 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 that i um okay let me shut up on that but one of the things that i am so convinced of as a priest is that in this century nobody should ever be ordained a priest if he doesn't have a degree in psychology i think it's, it's a terrible idea for people to see that the confessional and they can determine whether this person is having OCD or any anxiety problems. Mm -hmm. I think we are not helping ourselves uh, by giving the souls of persons or spirits of persons uh, to those who do not even know how to handle souls in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I have my way, nobody would ever be ordained a priest without having a degree in psychology. That's my conviction. Um, yes. It was amazing to be at the table at this time. Uh, mindfulness was one other thing that brought up. Uh, be mindful, be in the moment. Um, I'm remembering that Thich Nhat Hanh only met Thomas Burton once, but they were of a, of a similar spiritual mm -hmm. process in that time. Mm -hmm. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote The Miracle of Mindfulness and a lot of other books. But mm -hmm. yeah, so when you're washing the dishes, wash the dishes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very helpful, uh, that spiritual, there's this brother Lawrence in, was it in Canada, that was known for that, that any single thing is called the practicing the divine presence, that you believe that you are never alone any single, any single place you are. And the other thing that I also would like to talk about is that the fact that our church is not against therapy. I mean, there are some churches that do not go for therapy. Catholic Church is not one of them. Catholic Church, there are some times that we know that this person needs help, like <clears throat> serious help. There are some persons who actually, and I said this also in the morning, there are some persons that go for confession that I tell them, uh, you don't need confession, you need therapy. Uh, because whatever they are handling, whatever they are going through, is something that has affected their personality in such a way that it is not just me absolving them or, or the priest absolving them in the confessional doesn't solve their problems. And to be one thing I usually do as a priest in that situation is to follow them up and say, I'll talk to them and see if they are, I'll encourage, see a Christian therapist or a Catholic therapist who understands the value of your faith in, in, in having the, the therapy. It's always very good to approach it uh, that way. But I still think in the future, uh, and I'm pro they don't listen to me. You see, that's the problem. If they listen to me, <laughs> uh, like I said, nobody's going to be a priest with that. It doesn't solve all our problems, but it shows that our church is a little sensitive to the modern mind. 
the mother mind is a restless mind. Uh, the minds before were workaholic minds. Our minds does not, our minds these days are so, especially the our younger ones, they are so restless. That just saying, I absorb you of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, doesn't do much. Except there is this accompaniment, and uh, many priests don't actually have it too. Uh, and, uh, and I believe, <laughs> again, thank God they don't listen to me. Uh, I do believe that uh, with the sacrament, uh, many Catholics don't go to confession. That's just the truth. Uh, but a good number of Catholics go to therapy. <laughs> so why not let us just do it in such a way that the priest can also uh, do that. And I also believe that the pastor of the parish should never be sitting or any priest working in that parish should never be sitting every Saturday <clears throat> in the confessional. This is my idea. That if I'm a priest in St. Gertrude's, I should be assigned to St. Eta's for confessions. Oh. Oh. Yeah. It should never be like... Uh, yeah, thank God they don't listen to me. Um, how can we help people going through depression? Uh, yes. Practicing the divine what? Divine presence. Presence. Okay, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think we already answered this. How can we help people going through depression? Yes. Do you have any other thing that we have not said? You mean other than therapy? Yeah. <laughs> medication. Yeah, medication yeah, can be helpful. Yeah. We yeah. talked about community. Yeah. Okay. Yes, community. I mean, you know how much I love communities, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it just helps to know that you're not going through something alone. You know, you wanted to say something. Yeah, so there's an interesting thing that happened here at the parish that uh, may not be obvious anymore, but the 1030 gym mass was created as a space away from the big church because some people had traumatic experiences with the church and having it, having mass in a different building gave an opportunity for people to return who were still tr struggling with trauma. That is very, I never knew that part of it. I, I never knew that at all. And that is very enlightening in, 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 in a big way. Um, because I have always questioned, like, why do we have two masses going on simultaneously? Uh, so they used to not be simultaneous. Right. Oh, okay, okay. Because I was like, uh, we have shortage of priests. So what is going on here? Uh, but I, I think that is very interesting. And it introduces something very profound that some of these spaces can be very damaging sacred spaces can sometimes especially if we have experienced trauma trauma there can be very damaging and what is our solution in such cases what happens when people say the building does not give them the comfort again what happens? Do we have another space? Do you have an alternative space? Uh, in some, in Nigeria, growing up, for instance, we had what is called the basic Christian communities. Mm -hmm. So it's like um, it, it can give. They will have like the Granville community, for instance, that meets in a house one day in the week, and then they are able to celebrate mass in that house and be able to come together in that house. Uh, that can be. Uh, an option going forward, but we have to admit that our church has wounded a lot of people. Yes. And in a way also, uh, we also have to have a way of bringing those back, not br bringing the wounded back uh, with, a, with an idea about their healing. You know, we shouldn't just bring people back with their wounds. This should be an approach in which their healing will be possible and encouraged. You know, if I if I'm wounded in a space and I don't have the hope of healing, I'm never coming back to that space. I said something like a couple of weeks a couple of weeks ago in my first that there was a colloquium in 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 in, in a department. Uh, the school is called Loyola, um, in which at the end of the day I felt verbally attacked in one, after presenting my paper and I also felt that it has some racist charge to it and the person who stood by me then was my uh, dissertation director and he spoke and 
he was he was a god sent individual and he shut everybody's mouth off immediately that what is paul writing is he writing a dissertation or he's writing a mystery novel if he's writing a mystery novel there is a problem but if he's writing a dissertation that is what i want him to write leave him alone a couple of months later he died and they started calling me to come back to that colloquium and i said no i can't come back they said why i said because the only person who stood up by me is dead every other person there is a hawk and i don't want to be a meal on the table for them you know uh, so for me it's it's we have to have a way as a community to help people heal it is not the priest is not uh but it's your job. I, I sincerely would say this. It's the job of the lay people. The lay people in the Catholic Church are some of the most passive lay people in the world. We know what is right, but we shut up about it. Until it becomes a, a whole problem. And when we try to knock the door and the door is locked, if the door is locked. If you try to knock the door of the church to make a complaint, and the door is locked, break the door. Joint call to action. Yeah. yeah. Don't say that outside. Even though it's on Facebook. <laughs> um, how do we know how to walk away from a situation? What we talked about, uh, getting the inspiration from Elijah was, uh, was was to seek peace. Um, it was to bring us peace. Um, but there was that idea of like sometimes the idea of walking away feels like quitting or something like that. But um, I don't mean, but uh, at our table, someone made a point that you can uh, you can walk away temporarily. You don't have to walk away forever. Um, sometimes just taking a break, like Elijah did, getting the food in his corner, um, that could be a good way to walk away from the situation for a little bit and then come back and feel okay, you have a better piece of the Sometimes the best thing is just to walk away. I give the instance of uh, domestic violence. Nobody, nobody should um, endure domestic violence. You, you, every individual assesses the situation like you said, peace of mind, talking to others. Sometimes, like you said, what Elijah did was not walk away, really. He took a break. Mm -hmm. Sometimes taking a break is good for our mental health. Just taking that break is very good. And that's why we have vacations. Even though sometimes, like somebody asked me the last time that when I went to Nigeria, that did I rest very well? And my next answer was like, who goes to Nigeria to rest? <laughs> like, uh, who does that? Nobody goes to Nigeria to rest. But the, the point is that um, I, I wrote this out because there's a book on domestic violence. It's one of the best mm -hmm. books that I have read. It's called Invisible Bruises. Uh, and I think a couple of years ago, was it four years ago? This is 2020. Yes. In 2020, when my sister, my younger sister, was experiencing severe domestic violence in the house, mm -hmm. and I told her immediately, you have to leave that marriage. Like, there is no, if you don't leave that marriage, I'm not talking to you again, I'm not talking to your children again. And that evening she left and went to her parents' house. She was complaining and said, the Catholic Church says, do not divorce. And I said, are you the priest? <laughs> but you don't want to ordain it for the church? I am telling you, I don't want you dead. Uh, no marriage is worth the death of a partner. Mm -hmm. No. No. So, uh, but again, it, it's uh, one of the issues that was raised in the morning session is sometimes the complex nature of walking away from those uh, situations because sometimes the abuser, abusers are very smart. Oh, yeah. They are evilly smart. One of the first things that they do is to make sure they isolate the person they want to, to abuse. Cut them off. If that person has any uh, root or community, they try to cut them off, you know? Uh, so that's why it is very important that we support people. And uh, as a church, that's what I'm going to say. That, But it is every single one of us that can know exactly when to walk away from a situation. It is, it's almost like what we said about choosing our battles. There are some battles, just walk away from it. You don't, you don't have the energy 
just like go away. Uh, but there are some, uh, and somebody told me that it is not every time you see a door open that you go through the door. <coughs> that is true. Uh, but there are some times that walking away is the only thing that can give you a new lease of life. You know, uh, but to know to know <laughs> when to do that is what I think Coas points comes back to the question of does it give you peace of mind? Nobody's going to say that uh, walking away from a domestic situation will not give them a peace of mind. Uh, but the question still remains: How do they get support? How financially, emotionally? It's complicated. Yes. The other thing is, is that um, for real full abusers, um, once once the partner walks away, they're actually more likely to be killed. So that's the other part they need to. What? That is, but they are more likely to be killed. killed because it's not the, because because the, the thought process is if I can't have them, then no nobody can have them, and there's nothing left to lose. So mm -hmm. you know you've done the ultimate injury, and and lost so the way. abuser is more likely to kill yeah. the injured. Yeah, that's what the statistic says. Yeah, and it comes out in this in this particular book that um, yeah. And uh, sometimes also we overrate the support the society, law enforcement agencies yeah, give do. to abuse people. Because they you know? can't do anything until it's actually... Happened. Exactly. It's not like uh, we, we wait for somebody to be killed before they take actions. That's what happens most of the time. Or you know? Injured, yeah. Somebody gets arrested, then after two days, you throw them back into the same house where they were abusing the woman. Yeah, so, um, yeah, sometimes the only solution, not even the best solution, the only solution is to walk away. But it is not as simple as that. That's, uh, number five, number six. In first Kings, blah, 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 Elijah was afraid. How do we conquer our fears? Yes, what do we have to say? The world is waiting for you. <laughs> I guess they liked my depressive answer. Oh! Okay, what did you say, Catherine? I hate the phrase conquer our fears because I kind of thought of your conquer analogy with when you make your goal. Like, you're not going to conquer a fear when you don't know what the next one is going to be. Like, what will the next accomplishment or conquering of something be too much for you to handle? And then you're going to be vulnerable in a sense of not knowing when the last accomplishment is going to be the last one. Okay. You so, said earlier about you're most vulnerable after a success. Yes, 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 yes. It's yes. like you're running around after your goal mm -hmm. thinking, I have this, or this will be it. This okay. will be the, the fear I've conquered. This will be the end of my despair. And then somebody comes Oh, out. okay. Your point is that there's always a fear coming fears. out. I don't believe in conquering fear. So what do you do with fears? You embrace them. You're just, yeah, you're just in it. Yeah, you're always just in it. You're never conquering anything, because there's always other things that will get in the way of something else. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, there will always be fear, but it doesn't mean that every single fear that has always been there will always be there. For instance, if I'm afraid of spiders when I'm young, or if I'm afraid of Santa Claus, Santa Claus or I'm afraid of uh, whatever, as I'm growing, that fear is conquered in a way. I agree with you that fears would always show up. But I also think we need a strategy to be able to handle so that fears do not paralyze us. Because sometimes our fears paralyze us. Uh, so we need a, a strategy in which to say, okay, what do I do? Do I have like mindfulness? Do I have breathing techniques to just make sure that I am grounded? But there's always going to be another fear. Yes, but you can't... Let's conquer the one we have now and wait for the next one to come. So if you score a goal and then you are happy and then they score you a goal, go for another goal. It's as simple as that. 
<laughs> yes, Suzanne. I can give you a true example. Okay. My son had a fear of height, mm -hmm. and so when we had our roof being worked on, and the ladder was there, he decided he was going to conquer his fear. And he climbed up three quarters of the way, and I saw him, and I said, please come down, because it's, it's a, you, you've made your Point. conquest. Yeah. You, now come on down. Well, maybe because it was mom saying so, he went up the last quarter of the way, got up on the roof, and he freaked because he didn't know what his next step was going to be. And he said he was going to jump from the roof of the house to the roof of the garage because up there, the space looked smaller. And he was going to do it. He said, just leave me alone. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Or you can come up up into the third floor, that's how high he was, out the window and grab me. Sounds <laughs> oh. like a bad thing. I, 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 I did yeah. treat myself. Yes. And oh, so I called my brother, who also had fear of height. Of height. So <laughs> that's why he was down on the ground. <laughs> but when he saw this child up there, he went up. And he's three quarters of the way up, and he calls his son, who was working on the roof, and he comes over like, like he's walking on ground, the ground level. And he says, what's up, Dad? What are you doing up there? And he says, John's having a problem. Would you help him come down? Now, I, I don't know if this is completely true, but after he helped my son turn around on the ladder, which is a hard thing to do even if you're not afraid of fear of heights, my son has not been afraid of heights anymore. It's like it took him, it took everything out of him to be afraid and to try to fight that fear. And now he has no fear. So, but, but it was so irrational what he did, I would yeah. not recommend it to anybody. Yeah, I, I, I do think that it is possible to, I, I, two things, the, the two things are possible. That will conquer our fear, that's what also Raike says in Letters to the Young Poet. Conquer the demons, conquer our own fears. But that does not mean that once we conquer this, another one is not going to show up. But once we are able to conquer one, we are able to know that whatever fear comes up again, they are conquerable. And this is what uh, I think Tolkien says. We read about dragons in the Bible. Not so much where to prove where dragons exist or not. But to let us know that if dragons ever exist, they can be conquered. Okay, let's say the final prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Lord, I know that you love me, and that you have great plans for me. But sometimes I am overwhelmed by the love of my nature. Have a very safe drive home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, okay, okay. But well, thank you. Do they have a Nigerian? Uh, okay. Then Augustine and this guy, yeah. Or, or, or that of St. Augustine. Yeah, he's an Augustine. Yeah. He's a priest. That means he's a priest. Yeah. Okay. But well, thank you. Thank you for giving me this. I'll go through it, yeah.